Hello, family and friends. It is day 80 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. I'm Kanoi, and if you like this Bible study, if you have gotten anything from it, if you could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up, that way we can get other people passionate about the Word. Also, if you want to be a part of a tighter knit community, make sure that you join our Facebook group. All of those links can be found in the description box below, along with all of the tools that you will need to make this Bible study successful for you. And today's question of the day is, how how long have you been walking with Christ? How long has it been since you said your salvation prayer? Or how long have you been a Christian? And if you haven't yet said the salvation prayer, we give you an opportunity at the end of the video to do so, to become a part of the family of God. But for me, I have been walking with Christ since I was nine years old. So that has been, my math right now is about nine years old. It's been 33 years since I have known the Lord. Of course, I went wayward many times. I veered off to the right and to the left, but now we are on the straight and narrow. We are on the right road. We are living a life of holiness and doing our best to live a life that is set apart for Christ. But the reality is it doesn't matter how long you have been with him. It just matters that you are with him, that you are here trying to draw near to him. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we read your word today, Lord, help it to come to life. And forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yesterday we were reading about the blessings and the curses that would fall upon the people according to their obedience or disobedience. And today God is giving them some hope. Moses is going to tell them that if you repent and if you come back to the Lord, then he will restore you. So when all these things come upon you, meaning all these things, you will receive blessings and curses which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you return to the Lord your God. So there is a way to come back, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and all your soul. So not just part of you, but all of you, your love to the Lord, and also your mind and your emotions, your thoughts, the way that you think. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. And have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. And if your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. So Moses has a vision of the apostasy of Israel, but there's also a beautiful prophetic message that God will indeed restore Israel. Now, yesterday the question came up, how did the Holocaust come into our reading today? Are you saying that the Holocaust happened because the people didn't listen to God? Well, my thinking on that is that God knew that that was going to happen. So when he spoke these words through Moses, I believe that yes, the Holocaust and the way that the Jews were treated and the way that they were scattered all throughout the earth is a part of that word. Now this is not me saying that God created the Holocaust, but what I'm saying is that wasn't his heart, that he wanted that for his people, but he warned them, if you don't stay near me, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, you are going to fall to your enemies. And that's exactly what happened. But the beautiful part of it is that after World War II, the nation of Israel was reestablished and the people were able to return to this land that God had initially given to them. Now, all the Jewish people have not returned to Israel yet. That has yet to happen. So part of this prophecy has been fulfilled. Israel is more prosperous. It is more rich, it's larger, and it's got more people today than it did in the days of Abraham. That is something that will happen when Jesus again returns. So when we talk about the circumcision of the heart, this is the part that has not yet happened because the fact that Israel still rejects Jesus as the Messiah, their hearts have not turned back to God completely. So this will happen because when Jesus returns for his second coming, Israel will recognize Jesus as the true Messiah. 
And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of the ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments, his statutes that are written in this book of the law otherwise known as Deuteronomy, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So not just having a relationship with him, but truly knowing him with your mind, knowing his word, knowing what it means to love him as God. For this commandment that I command you today, it's not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. Oh boy, when I read that, I thought, uh uh-oh, I spoke a little too loosely yesterday when I said, it is impossible to lead a sinless life. Here the word says, it isn't impossible. And then when I thought about it, I'm like, well, that's true because with God, all things are possible. It is possible to live a sinless life. But the fact of the matter is, is that none of us have done that except for one man, which was Jesus. But that doesn't mean that we can't do it. And that's what God is telling the people here. You know the word. It is written on your hearts. You have been hearers of it. You've learned it since you were children. It is near you and I am with you. Therefore, you can do this. I am not giving you a task that is too hard. The people have a choice, just like we have a choice to choose life, death, to choose good, evil, to choose righteousness or sin. And it's not impossible because we have the Lord with us. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over to the sea for us and bring the word back to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. So you can do it. So when we get the word down into our heart, when we start to speak it out with our mouths, when we start to understand it, to know it and be doers of it, our desires for the Lord will inevitably change. Our response to him will now be out of love and not trying to earn his love or forgiveness. We aren't going to try to do good because we're trying to make sure God loves us. We are instead going to respond to him because we love him, plain and simple, and we desire to do what pleases him. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, so this is your heart, this is uh, part of your doing, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering and to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you will surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and a curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, Jacob, to give to them. So we are faced with the same choice today. We can either choose life or we can choose death. We're either going to choose Jesus or not. He is our life. And God is going to be glorified no matter what happens, no matter if Israel turns to him or no matter if we turn to him, God will be glorified in the end. It's really up to us how he is glorified or is he going to be glorified through what happens to us because we don't obey him or is he going to be glorified because of the blessings that are poured out because we've obeyed him. So now we're getting a preview of what God is doing in this new season that is coming for the Israelites. So Moses continued to speak these words to all of Israel and he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. And this isn't because he's old and can't walk. I mean, because we're going to see him climb a mountain. So (laughs) he's still physically okay to do that. But he can't go out and come in simply because God has commanded it. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. So God is not going to leave them. He's saying, I'm not going with you all, but God himself will be with you. He will still destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. 
and Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. So he's saying, you're going to get a new leader here and it is Joshua. So beautiful promise here that God will not leave them. He won't forsake them. He will remain with them. He'll protect them. He'll bless them. He'll fight for them. Just as Jesus promises this to the church today. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you, and he will not forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers and to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. There are so many beautiful things happening in these couple of verses. One, we're seeing the public transfer of authority. Because if Moses simply passes away and Joshua says, I'm your new guy, I don't know that anyone would believe him. They needed to have this ceremony, this passing of the torches, if you will, for Moses to say, this is your guy. He's the one who's going to take you into the promised land. So his public encouragement of Joshua is also an encouragement for the people. Because again, if he simply passed away and Joshua rose up and said, don't fear guys, I've got you covered. I think the people would inevitably be fearful. They would not only question Joshua's motives, but they would question whether or not God was still with them. So Moses is saying publicly, be strong, be courageous, do not fear. And to this day, God speaks that over our lives. Be strong, be courageous, do not fear, for he did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. And fear is one of the devil's greatest weapons that he will use against us. Something that you already have that he is going to use against you. So you got to get rid of that fear. We've got to cast it out because if we hold on to that, we are giving the enemy the ability to grab hold of it and to use it against us. And he will use the fear to keep you from going into something greater, to keep you from stepping up into something even more beautiful. He will try to tell you, no, you can't do that. Mm, no, nope, you're not good enough. Mm, nope, you don't got what it takes. Nope, it's gonna be too hard for you. Mm -mm, that's impossible. Mm -mm, you're not worthy to receive that blessing. He will whisper those things over and over and over until you start to believe it. So this is why these are the last words of Moses because he knows what the enemy is going to do. Try to keep the people from taking hold of the biggest and best promise that God has for them. And I just think to myself, if we had more people like Moses who were encouragers instead of critics, who were loving on people instead of hating on them, this world would be a much better place. So, you know, let us be more like Moses. Be like Moses, hashtag be like Moses, whatever you want to say. I mean, his encouragement of Joshua was really the heart of God, right? To tell him, you can do this. He isn't giving him fluff. He isn't saying, Joshua, you are so amazing. You are the best leader ever. No, he's telling him, be strong, be courageous. I think because he knows Joshua probably isn't at this point. He's probably second guessing himself. He's probably insecure in the fact that Moses is leaving. He's got to now fill these huge shoes. So Moses isn't blowing smoke here. He is telling them, this is what you got to do. Pull up your big boy pants and let's get moving. So we've got to be that for people. Then Moses wrote this law. Now he literally wrote the law. I mean, he scribed it out. He gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release at the Feast of Booths, when all of Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose. So at the tabernacle or later on the temple. You will read this law before all of Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, little ones, sojourners within your towns, that they may hear, that they may 
Learn to fear the Lord your God and to be careful to do all the words of this law and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over to the Jordan to possess. This is probably one of those facts that you may have overlooked in the past. Like, okay, great. They're going to read the word to them every seven years. But when we look at the significance of it, if you really think about it, okay, every seven years, a person changes in their impressionability. So much will happen in those seven years, and once again, they are impressionable and will probably hear the word differently than they heard it the first time, and they will hear the word differently. Now, what's the point of reading the word aloud? Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So every time we hear the word, and every time someone confesses it with their mouth, faith is being worked out. Because the Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. So not only are you to just be a reader of the word, but also a hearer of the word, a speaker of the word, and therefore a doer of the word. And when that happens, you will start to see refreshment in your soul. You will start to be able to rejoice and you will be released from the things that were holding you captive. So I want to do a heart check here. It's been a while since we've done one of these. Since you have been in this Bible study or since you have been reading the words, so it could have been before this Bible study, how have you seen your life change? Do you feel refreshed? Do you feel more rejoiceful? Do you feel like you have been released from something? Let me know in the comments below. How has the word of God, the reading of it, the hearing of it, the speaking of it, the doing of it, changed your life? And now we will see the commissioning of Joshua to lead Israel. So this is like Moses' retirement. And I was a little sad about this, I'm not going to lie. And this is the inauguration of Joshua into this position. So the Lord said to Moses, Behold the day's approach when you must die, Moses. So call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may commission him. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud. So his presence was there with them. And the pillar of cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering and they will forsake me and they'll break my covenant that I have made with them. And then my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be devoured and many evils and troubles will come upon them so that they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done because they have turned to other gods. Well, how's that for a dying speech? Lying on your deathbed and hearing your children are going to rebel. I can't imagine how Moses must have felt. And now God is going to tell him, and by the way, I want you to write a song about it. Here we go. Write this song. Teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song will be a witness for me against the people of Israel. So this song is not going to be a happy song. It's going to be a uh, testimony against the people. For when I've brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and have grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in their mouths of their offspring." live unforgotten. I like that. For I know that they are inclined to do even today before I've brought them into the land that I swore to give. So God sees already what is going to happen. Moses sees what's going to happen. And this song is something that they are going to be able to commit to memory because music does that. It helps you to remember things. And it's going to be something that confronts them. It is going to convict their hearts. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. And the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, be strong and courageous for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. So when Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book or the Torah to the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law, put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Behold, even today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? 
Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death, you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you because the Lord told him that would happen. And in the days to come, evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. And then we're left with a little bit of a cliffhanger. We don't get to hear the song today. Of course, you can go and read it for yourself, but it will span across the next couple of pages of your Bible before Moses gives his final blessing and his life comes to an end. And even though Moses knew and God told him and therefore God knows that the people are going to rebel against him, he doesn't let go. He loves them so much. He loves them eternally. Therefore, that promise still remains that Israel will be restored. And because we are the new Israel or we are the bride of Christ, when Jesus came, we have a direct access to the Father we are able to sit comfortably in that love, to rest in that comfort, to know that God will never leave us, that he will never forsake us, that we can be strong, that we can be courageous, that he wants to bless us, that he wants to prosper us, but we still need to keep our eyes on him. We need to remain in obedience. We need to continue to repent and to live a life that is holy and set apart. Because remember, it's about the full nature of God. There's a great love that desires to have relationship with us, but there's a second part to that in our obedience and our desire to then come and live in unity with him and in communion with him and to walk in step with him. And it's all possible because of our own Joshua, because of Jesus, because he is going to be the one to lead us the entire way into that promise. So Jesus, we thank you so much for what you have done for us. Thank you again for being our Joshua, who is leading us, who's guiding us, who loves us, who'll never leave us. We thank you so much that we are on the brink of a new season, that there is a harvest out there, that we are about to break forth into something even greater. So help us to keep our eyes on you, to stay focused on you, to hold your hand, to never let go, and to never turn our backs on you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.